Can anyone hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, Commander Gallo. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but um, I'm looking at my picture and it just says USNA Commander, blah, blah, blah. So let's see if screen share, maybe I'm supposed to click on that. Start video. Start video sounds good. Let me try, hold on, let me try to make you a co-host really quick. Give that one a shot. Select the camera, FaceTime. There we go. We're cooking. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Commander. Appreciate it. All righty. And we should have a good cast of students and families joining us as well. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kevin O'Neill. Um, I am the Congressman's District Policy Aide. Uh, we'll get going in just a few moments, let a few of the late tricklers come on in. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have a great panelist, a uh, group of panelists today from each of the service academies that are going to speak about the different academies and what they have to offer if you're interested in applying and some of the other opportunities that they have outside of the application cycle, both in the summer and to just visit the uh, academies themselves to learn more. I'm joined by my colleague, Jenna Masood, um, who is our senior uh, district representative um, who helps uh, facilitate our nomination process within the Congressman's office. And we're gonna go over a brief overview in just a few moments when everybody gets signed on to talk about our process and then hand it over to the academies who I'm sure you're more excited to learn about from, uh, to hear about all the great uh, technology courses and extracurricular offerings they have in the classroom. And then afterwards, what a career and service looks like from each of the academies for the five-year period and then beyond if you're interested. So we'll get going in just a few moments. All righty, looks like we're nearing 40 attendees, um, which is around what we were expecting today. Um, so we're going to kick it off uh, first with a brief moment of silence um, after the tragic shooting in Uvalde, Texas today that took uh, 14 students' lives and a teacher's lives. We're just gonna take a brief moment of silence to reflect on the lives lost today. Thank you all very much. And Jenna and I are going to kick it off with just a brief overview of what the congressional nomination process looks like on our end. Um, so every year the congressman gets to nominate uh, individuals, very talented students from across the district to the different service academies. Uh, we're joined, as I said, by representatives from each of those academies today to speak a little bit more about their process and how it's very similar to ours, but somewhat different as well. Um, so very basic, uh, we're gonna start off with ours. As I said, go through the service academies one by one with questions after each of the academies today. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, put those in the Q&A chat at that time and we will direct you just to remind you then. And then we're just gonna do a, a few closing remarks as well. Um, the Congressman unfortunately was unable to join us today, uh, but he did want to thank all of you for your interest in attending one of these service academies and also um, the dedication to service. So we will hear some remarks from him a little bit later. Um, but this is our, our wonderful Congressman. Um, my boss is, as I like to phrase it, um, he's been serving the fourth congressional district. He's in his first term, his second year. Um, so this is the second cycle that he gets to nominate talented students from across the district uh, to pursue a life of service at one of these academies. Um, so we cover all the way from the northern side of the district, just outside of Boston in, in Newton, Wellesley, and Needham, uh, all the way west to Hopkinton, Milford, and Hopedale, and down south through our major cities, Attleboro, Taunton, and all the way down to Fall River. 
River. Um, we are redistricting um, in the coming term. Uh, so next year we will be redistricting, but for individuals interested in applying for a service academy nomination from the Congressman this year, they will have to live in the district as, as it is drawn right now within this parameter. Um, if anybody has questions later on and after this uh, session, we'll have our contact information if you have questions, if you're in or outside of the district. And I'd like to turn it over to Jenna to talk a little bit about what our process looks like. Yeah, so thank you, Kevin, for kicking it off. So um, what is a congressional nomination? So any student who is interested in attending a U.S. service academy also needs to receive a nomination from their member of Congress. This is true for four of the five. So for West Point, Navy, Air Force, and Merchant Marines, you need to apply through our office to get a nomination. In addition to be, being accepted by the Academy itself, you do not need a congressional nomination to apply to the Coast Guard Academy. So if that is your ideal, your dream school, you don't need to go through this process that Kevin and I are about to go over. Um, but yeah, so you can receive a nomination for a service academy either from your representatives in the House of Representatives, um, you can receive them from your senators, from the vice president, and then there are special categories, for example, for um, students who are the children of deceased or disabled veterans, Medal of Honor recipients, et cetera. Um, every representative and senator uses a different criteria in their selection process for a nomination. So if you apply through our office and also apply through the offices of Senators Warren and Markey, you would most likely have to go through a different you will have to go through a different process for their offices. So just keep that in mind when you're considering the workload it takes to get a nomination. You are encouraged to seek a nomination from as many sources as you're eligible for. So if you don't receive one from Senator Warren's office, you may still receive one from our office. So definitely seek out all the available options. In our office, we like to use a holistic approach. So while there is a heavy emphasis placed on your academics, mainly your GPA, we also like to consider your interview, your personal statement, your extracurriculars and resume. So we look at the candidate as a whole and not just as one, one statistic or number. Um, and last point here is that we utilize an independent panel to interview all of the students who are applying for a nomination. So those folks are people from our district who either served in the military and or attended a US service academy. So. Um, we really try to get all perspectives when considering each student. I think I'm kicking it back to Kevin here. And to, to follow up on Jenna's point, the holistic approach is what we really look for. And you'll hear that from our counterparts in each of the academies as well. We want students who, are, who really sound academically, who have a, a strong um, career our uh, strong trajectory in the STEM fields, especially. Um, these are very strong STEM schools and you'll, you'll hear that emphasized as well. So there's a very heavy focus uh, in math and science in that regard. But we also wanna make sure that you're a leader in the community, in the classroom or, or on the sports field if that's your chosen leadership arena. So with that, um, a few of the more logistical eligibility requirements. Um, first, it's a residency requirement. You have to reside in the fourth congressional district. The only exception is for the Merchant Marine Academy. You are allowed to reside within the state of Massachusetts and apply to our office for a nomination for the Merchant Marine Academy. All the other academies that you need a nomination for, you must reside within the district. Uh, you must be at least 17 years old when you are applying and are going to be transitioning into one of the academies, but you cannot be past your 23rd birthday. Um, the later shouldn't apply to many of you, but you must be at least 17 year, years old before you can apply and attend these academies. You must be a U.S. citizen. Uh, you must be unmarried, not pregnant, and without any obligations for chi uh, to support any children or other dependents. And then there are a variety of medical, physical, and academic school requirements that the academies will require that they will touch on a little bit later. And with that um, comes just our side of what we require when it comes to documentation. Um, so first, there will be an initial application on our website. We will be updating that in the weeks to come after this sub, uh, webinar today. Um, and that information should be submitted to our Newton office, which you'll find the address on our website. Um, second, a personal statement. This is one of the most uh, 
important pieces of your of your application, I really will be able to allow us to delineate who is a, a great student to who is an exceptional student, who on face, if you both have 4.0 GPAs, why someone can can demonstrate to us that you will be successful in one of these academies and beyond when you choose your career of service. Um, also, we, as we emphasize, we do care very highly about academics. So we will need official high school transcripts sent directly from your school officials. So um, over the next couple of years or year, I'll work with your guidance counselors to be able to, one, prepare yourself academically, and then two, make sure you can send us that information. Um, ACT scores and SAT scores, uh, we do, have that as an opportunity to submit those if you believe those are good markers of your academic ability. However, if for some reason you are not a strong test taker and you feel like you just weren't performing the best that day, we will weight your GPA higher um, instead of taking those scores into consideration, which Jenna will talk a little bit about in a few minutes. Um, resume of extracurricular activities, that's very important for us to see what kind of leadership abilities you've taken on outside of the classroom, be it sports, a club, within your community, doing community service. We really want to see um, how you've continued to develop your leadership skills and how you can continue to develop those moving into to one of these academies. And then we asked the three letters of recommendation. Um, most of them we asked for at least one from a teacher, um, one from uh, someone, a uh, coach or a mentor that knows about your leadership ability. And then the third one can be from whoever you would like. We just ask that you do not get a letter of recommendation from a family member, but it is from someone who can speak a little bit more to your academic or leadership abilities. And then last, we'll have an interview with our, our panel to be able to uh, speak a little bit more um, freely about why you believe you're a great fit for an academy and get to know you just on a personal level. You know, we get to read a lot of your amazing accomplishments, a lot of your academic prowess in these applications. We want to know what type of person you're going to be at the end of the day, if you have that character fit for these academies, and if we believe you're going to represent our district very well at these academies. So those are all important things for us to know. And last but not least, one of the more important things is that our due date is October 21st. That is different from the due date of the academies and it's a completely different application process. So as you start preparing and getting your documentation in, in order, make sure you understand that you will have to submit two separate applications, one to the Academy of Interest and also one to our office. So just make sure that you're aware of the deadlines for each of those different means. This is how we look at the app. Oh, can you go back, Kevin. Yeah, so if, this is how we look at the application. So um, we do place a pretty good emphasis on GPA. We rate it at 50%, um, with the exception that if you choose not to submit your SAT slash ACT score, your GPA will be bumped a bit higher to 65% weight. Um, but then we do put some good emphasis on, like Kevin said, leadership, extracurriculars, letters of rec, and interview. Um, we, know, we know the academies take a holistic approach in looking at their candidates, and we want to mimic what they're looking for in the students that they think would be the best fit for their academy. This is our selection process. So um, once we get all the materials in, we will um, assign interview slots and we will work with our interview panel to evaluate each and every application. Um, we can nominate up to 10 students per open slot at, academy, at each academy. So typically every year we will have one open spot for each academy. We can nominate up to 10 students for that slot. It doesn't mean that only one of those 10 students has the option to get into the academy. It just means that our office independently has the ability to send in 10 names that we think would be a good fit for the academy. Um, we ask you on your application to rank your preference of academies. So if we have a very competitive field for the Naval Academy this year, um, and we have 12 great applicants for the Naval Academy and 11 and 12 might not get that nomination, but if their second choice is Air Force, we might be able to, give them a nomination to the Air Force Academy instead if we have space for that. So um, it is important that when you're ranking your academies that you really think about if your first choice can't be an option with our nomination process, where could you see yourself fitting in after that? Because that's a very, could be a very viable option for you. Um, and then a point to emphasize is a nomination from our office does not guarantee admission to an academy. You do need to have a nomination in order to be admitted to an academy, 
but it isn't a guarantee. So um, we just want to make that really clear from the get-go that even though we may feel you're a great fit for an academy, it's still up to the academy to admit you. And then, so just a note on timeline, I know we already touched this, but the application is currently open. We did not change the year, but the, app, the application is currently open. You'll find it on our website. Um, they are due in hard copy on October 21st. Um, we're a little old school with how we like to get those and be able to read all the applications. We will be conducting interviews in late November and early December. Um, and then we will let you know if you received a nomination from our office by the end of December. So our deadline to get them to the academies, considering redistricting is December 31st. So you will know before that if you've received a nomination from our office. Kevin. And just a few options that we want to touch upon um, just for students who are interested in attending one of the academies but not, might not know if it's the right fit for them. You also want to start looking at universities or regions that also offer ROTC as an option. Um, so the Air Force, the Naval Academy, and the uh, Merchant Marine Academy all, or the Army all have um, ROTC options. Uh, there are a number within the Boston area if you want to stay local, but nationally they all have different chapters as well. This is a great way to become an officer while going to civilian university. So if you don't make uh, the, uh, if you get a nomination but are not admitted into one of these uh, service academies and not given an offer of appointment, these are also great opportunities if you do want to uh, seriously follow a career of service in the military to be able to become a trained officer while still attending civilian university. So we highly recommend checking out the different websites and locating some of the different ROTC programs at some of the civilian universities you may be applying for. <clears throat> And then this is where uh, we'll open it up for some questions for Jenna and myself. Um, our contact information is listed right there. Jenna will be your main point of contact for this cycle. Um, so that will be her email, her first name period, her last name at mail.house.gov, and the best way to reach her at our office number. But I'll leave a few minutes um, at the end here to answer any questions specifically about our process and the congressional nomination process in our office. So if you do have a question, feel free to just type in the chat and we'll answer it live here right now. All right, Kevin, so I'll let you answer this. Can you be nominated for more than one academy? Sure, uh, great question, Steve. Um, so our policy um, that we've had for the last year is no. Um, we have a number of amazing applicants. Um, so typically we do not nominate to multiple academies. We uh, ask students to pick the, the top academy that they're interested in. That being said, if there is a truly outstanding candidate um, or if there's not as many applicants as years past, uh, we will be open to that idea. But uh, most of the time, uh, the answer is no, that we do just nominate to your top academy. If you do not, um, or if you're not, as Jenna said earlier, one of the top applicants to that and you just fall under that 10th applicant that we can send to an academy, that's when we'll uh, look to your second academy as an option. And Jenna, I'll give you this one from Amelia. Based on the timeline, would one start the application process in their junior year? So that is completely up to you. Um, we do accept applications at any time up until October 21st, but um, it's really going to depend on how long you will think it will take you to compile all the necessary info to work on that personal statement. So we, um, we, don't weigh, we don't weigh applications differently depending on what time of year they come into us. So again, it's completely your choice. And Amelia, I'll add on to that to say some students enjoy waiting um, into their senior year because they might get a captain position <clears throat> in one of their uh, programs, they might get um, an executive board position in one of the clubs they're in, or they might have some grades that they want to include. 
our admission pro or our application process is not rolling. So we do not give someone an, um, a nomination early on and then consider someone based on that what's remaining. We review all of them at the end of October. Um, so don't feel like if you submit in August versus if you submit in October, you're behind in October. We just want to make sure that we get the best picture of who you are when you're closest to applying. So if you believe it's a little bit more beneficial to wait until the early fall, feel free to do that. In the interest of time, what I did was I actually just took a photo of the other questions that came in. So we will respond to you all um, if you want to. Um, I just think we should move on to the next academies. But um, I see a question in the chat from John about um, Merchant Marine or Kings Point and if you can um, apply to more districts. So um, I think we'll. Sorry, that wasn't that concise, but I think we should move on in the interest of time. And if there's any question relevant to a specific academy, if the academy rep wants to address that in their presentation, that would be great. And if we didn't get to your question, we will get back to you after the fact. Just send me an email and we'll get back to you. Absolutely. So let me kick it over to Mr. Robert Lynch. He is here to represent uh, the United States Merchant uh, Military Academy. He is a 97 graduate himself, and he's going to present a little bit about what the offerings of the Military Academy are. Okay. Uh, thanks. I'm going to share my screen here, but uh, I don't know if you can see that all right. Perfect, Mr. Lynch. Great, uh, thanks all. I know I've got probably about 10 minutes, but I have, uh, I've had the, the privilege to work with individuals from all of the academies represented on the call here. So if you're a, a leader, if you have the capacity to learn, if you're looking for a challenge, uh, you're on the right call. There's something here for you. But uh, I'll get started with West Point. I grew up in uh, West Roxbury and Needham. I had no idea about the military academies before I started looking into it. So you're in a good spot. So. Um, I, uh, uh, what we'll cover is just a broad overview of uh, the experience you can expect at uh, West Point, what there, are, what there is to offer, some of the, the differentiators there and some uh, application highlights to build on uh, what Kevin and Jenna have covered uh, so far. So overall, uh, West Point is focused on developing uh, leaders of character and that covers while you're at the academy, obligations in terms of academics, military, athletic, or fitness, uh, and they put you in challenging situations uh, of an increasing extent through your, through your time there to get you ready for military service afterwards, and even beyond military service if you, if you choose to leave after your, uh, after your commitment. And I mean, what they're looking for and, and your, your thought process when you're applying is they're, they're looking for people that are uh, that have a priority on providing service to our nation, whether it being in the military or in the community afterwards. Um, and it will push you. It's a challenging place, but the, it's very rewarding. Uh, for, it's the best decision I think I've made and that's had a profound impact on my, on my life. But it will challenge you academically, mentally, physically, and it will drive you to become a, a better leader. And for the uh, in the academy, for those aren't, that aren't familiar, it is a mixture of uh, it is an academic institution. So through your four years there, you get a, an undergrad degree, and the focus during the academic year is on academics with some military obligations. Uh, but after uh, graduation from the academy, uh, you will uh, serve for five plus years, uh, uh, ideally for, for more than that in one of the branch opportunities or job fields uh, listed here. Uh, that can range from anything from, uh, from infantry, aviation, uh, to if, you know, ultimately if you wanna become a doctor or a lawyer uh, or any number of, uh, of branches in here. My branch out of here was aviation. I was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot for, for seven years. Um, uh, but I've had a lot of friends in all of these, uh, all of these different uh, job fields uh, that still serve uh, that still serve today. Uh, West Point was was founded in, in 1802 by uh, by President Jefferson uh, as the first military academy, uh, first school of engineering. Uh, it was founded on uh, the curriculum was based on the on the fair approach. Uh, it's essentially. As a cadet, uh, this is applied in many institutions, uh, but as a cadet, you'll 
essentially teach yourself coming in prepared. So your first day of class at West Point, you will have already uh, done all of your work and prepared for that day to come in prepared to answer questions and be challenged and, and learn in that way. And it's a, um, it was a change for me, but it's, uh, it is a, it, it's a rewarding experience. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there is a, a legacy of leadership here. Here is a, just a few of the, uh, the prominent graduates uh, from West Point, ranging from uh, president to uh, leaders in business to athletics um, and several senior leaders in the military or, or government. Uh, so there's a, a rich history there uh, that we're uh, that we're quite proud of, and you'll you'll find similar uh, legacies in the other academies as well. Uh, one of the um, you know the questions is a it's a big uh, big change for students coming into West Point. What the cadet experience is like. So there are the summers are filled up mostly with uh, with military training. And, um, and, and experience. But during the academic year, uh, you go through a normal academic curriculum. Uh, there's class sizes are small, 15 to 18. Uh, that has its pros and cons, because uh, you can, uh, there's nowhere to hide uh, for people like me. You have to, have to be on your toes. But um, the, the faculty there is a mix of full-time civilian professors, some permanently assigned army officers, and uh, about 50% of officers that rotate there uh, through there on two to three year assignments. Uh, there's been quite a number of achievements from Rhodes Scholars to, uh, to Mitchell Scholarships to, to um, quite a number of academic achievements. And so it is a, uh, it is a, a prestigious academic institution. Um, and, that, uh, and that's where, uh, you know, they're, they're looking for candidates like uh, Kevin and Jenna had, uh, had outlined. Um, for the academic majors, while it was originally primarily an engineering institution, the uh, academic majors have expanded to include political science, law, uh, medical history, IT, uh, any number of, um, of majors that, can, uh, that, that you can find at other institutions as well. But it's a, it's a wide range of majors as well as uh, minors that can help uh, round out that experience. I was an engineering management major with a civil engineering uh, minor. Uh, and I think everybody qualifies for physical fitness uh, minor as well. Um, as far as the military journey, uh, the column on the left, Plebe Yearling Cal University, that's essentially Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, uh, that, those were our terms for it. But the, there was a, a more common uh, level of training for, uh, for the first couple of years. There's basic training and more field training. That's common to all the cadets. Once you get into your junior and senior year, there's more uh, leadership development training and more opportunities to do uh, more diverse uh, activities based on your uh, interests as well as uh, as well as military qualification schools, uh, which I think we'll cover on um, a couple of the next slides. But some of those broadening opportunities outside of the academic year in the summer are semesters abroad where you could travel to another military academy or another institution um, and, uh, abroad. There are internships in the White House, uh, different government agencies. I was an intern at the Naval Research Lab uh, while my friends were interns at the Pentagon and the Supreme Court during the summer there, uh, or military qualification school for airborne air assault, essentially jumping out of airplanes. I think I saw an airborne qualified uh, Air Force officer on here, uh, and, uh, or air assault, uh, which is essentially repelling out of helicopters, which I got to do for, uh, for a summer. Um, and so what it takes to join. I think uh, Kevin and Jenna have uh, outlined you know, what they're looking for, which is consistent with what the academies are looking for, um, where there is a high emphasis on, on academic performance uh, rounded out by uh, leadership experience uh, and input from uh, objective observers for, uh, for your leadership capabilities, uh, as well as uh, fitness. The CFA stands for Candidate Fitness Assessment. Uh, which is, you can find online, there's a, a series of, of tests to qualify uh, from, a, from a fitness perspective uh, to qualify for the um, nomination and acceptance. Um, I think 
Kevin and Jenna have gone through the uh, uh, the nomination process, and they've they've covered it uh, they've covered it pretty well. So I won't uh, I won't reiterate uh, reiterate that uh, for the sake of time. But uh, I think you know if you are you know, a leader, if you're up for a challenge, and if you're interested in a career in the military, this is an excellent spot uh, excellent spot to land. And I think Kevin had mentioned. Uh, there are opportunities to get an experience of what that is like. I think I would have loved to have gone through this before uh, before West Point, but I didn't get the chance to. But there's a summer leadership experience um, uh, for for juniors. I think it's a bit late, so for anybody that's a sophomore going into their junior year, this is a consideration for next summer. But this is uh, an excellent program to give you exposure to what academic classes, military training, physical fitness, to give you an idea of. Uh, of what you might be in store for to give you a better taste for that. And um, I think that's it. That's a that's just a, a brief introduction. Um, happy to answer any questions. There's also a lot of information online through the admissions team at uh, West Point, but uh, I think I'll, I'll pause there and see if there's any, uh, any questions. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Lynch. And similar to how we did it last time, folks, if you have a question for Mr. Lynch about West Point, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, feel free to utilize the Q&A function uh, throughout as well now that he has finished speaking. If you have a question that pops up during another presentation for him specifically, um, he can answer, answer it live in the Q&A function. But we'll give a couple of minutes before we turn it over to Commander Gallo. Not seen any movement. We'll give it right over. Oh, one question just popped in as I was speaking. So the question is, when would be the best time to do an overnight at the academy, and when should you conduct your field force interview? Uh, I'll get back to you on the field force interview. To do an overnight at the academy, I think it would be uh, most helpful during the academic year. Uh, sometime in the spring to get a, an idea of what a day in the life of a cadet. I imagine that would be the uh, purpose behind the a visit would be, but sometime during the academic year to give you a sense of what the experience would be like. Um, I'll have to follow up with the best time to uh, conduct the field force interview, but you could reach out anytime uh, to the field force for, for questions and more guidance on, uh, on, on the process, as well as getting lined up with the uh, admissions for things like a, a visit. Awesome, and we will turn it over to Commander Gallo to talk a little bit about the Naval Academy. All right. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yes, Commander, you are all set. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can we see it? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I do not see the screen change just yet, Commander. All right, hold on, let's see. Share, open system preferences. All right, are we there now? Not yet. Looks like we're still having a little bit of technical difficulty on that part. And now you sent me a backup, so I can try to pull that up on my screen to see if that will help. All right.
How about now? That looks good to me, Commander. Excellent. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kevin and Jenna. So my name is Jay Gallo. I'm a 1982 graduate of Annapolis. I served in submarines and I retired as a commander in the Naval Reserves. I currently support the Naval Academy as a blue and gold officer. And my job as a blue and gold officer is to help candidates navigate through the admissions and nomination processes. The purpose of the Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically to be officers in the United States Navy or in the Marine Corps. Annapolis is located in Maryland, about 25 miles from Baltimore and 25 miles from Washington. It is on the Severn River, and which is, uh, leads into the Chesapeake Bay. So a student body is known as the Brigade of Midshipmen. It is, con consists of individuals from all 50 states and territories. The brigade is made up of about 70% men, 30% female. The total size of the brigade is about 4,500 students, which works out to be about 11 to 1,200 students per class. If you attend the Naval Academy, uh, we offer the following majors in engineering and weapons, mathematics and science, humanities and social sciences. Uh, by law, 60% uh, of every class will major in either engineering, weapons, mathematics, or science. We keep you pretty busy, as do all the service academies. If uh, Four slash C stands for fourth class. Your first year at the Naval Academy, you'll take a minimum of six classes, and that's in addition to a physical education requirement, as well as mandatory athletics. You'll take classes in leadership and seamanship in blue. You'll take math and science classes, which are in pink, and you'll take humanity classes, which are in green. Uh, like West Point, we have a, a small class size, anywhere from 10 to 25 students per section. Uh, you work intimately with the faculty. Um, our staffing is slightly different than West Point's, so we have military and civilian faculty in a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, a typical schedule for a fourth class midshipmen starts rather early, 5.30 in the morning. Uh, military and academics throughout the day. You'll see that every day at four o'clock, there's an athletic period. Everyone participates in athletics. That is in addition to a class that you may have in physical fitness. Your athletic period could be that you're a varsity athlete. It could be that you are on a club sport. And if you are not a varsity athlete or a club athlete, you participate in intramural activities. Uh, intramural activities happen throughout the full academic year. That means there's three seasons, fall, winter, and in spring. Uh, while you're at the Naval Academy, you are serving in the US Armed Forces. The United States Navy will pay you in addition to covering your tuition, room board, medical and dental while you're at the academy, you receive a salary every month, 12 months out of the year. Uh, that salary goes into a fund which is used to pay for certain expenses while you're at the Naval Academy. And you do receive a stipend every month while you're there and that stipend changes as you go through the four years. Um, since the United States Navy is paying you year round, they will keep you busy year round. So summer is broken into three, four week periods. Every midshipman will undergo leadership development training for four weeks, a fleet cruise for four weeks, and then there's four weeks of vacation. However, uh, many midshipmen use a portion of that vacation time for internships, summer school, or additional leadership development. We talked about basic eligibility earlier. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the admissions process. So there are four components to admission at the United States Naval Academy. You need to 
get through all four of these in order to be eligible for an offer of appointment. So last year, approximately 16,000 individuals started the application process, became official candidates. And of those 16,000, roughly 3,400 individuals were able to successfully complete the admissions board, were physically qualified, were medically qualified, and had obtained a nomination. And of those 3,400 fully qualified individuals, the Naval Academy offered 1,100 appointments. So depending on your congressional district, which is where you compete, if there are 10 nominations handed out by the congressman and all 10 of those individuals successfully complete the admissions, the physical and the medical qualification, you are one of 10 individuals looking to receive an offer of appointment. Um, not all congressional districts are competitive in the same way. So there are some competitive, there are some congressional districts in Massachusetts where um, all 10 individuals who've been nominated do not complete the other three requirements. And so the likelihood of receiving an appointment uh, is different. So if you apply to the Naval Academy, you complete an online application and that online application keeps track of these 11 items. And you can see that item number two is the candidate fitness assessment. That's the physical qualification. You can see that item 10 is the Department of Defense Medical Examination Review Board. That is the medical requirement. Item 11 is your nomination and all the other items uh, per come together in the Academic Review Board. The physical qualifications, our candidate physical fitness assessment may be different than other service academies. It involves these six items. The test is usually administered by someone at your high school. The Department of Defense Medical Examination Review Board or DODMERB, you may hear it. Um, there's just one medical exam for all service academies and officer accession programs such as Naval ROTC or Air Force ROTC or Army ROTC. So you only complete this once. However, I will tell you that every service academy and accession program has a different set of standards, which means that you could be fully medically qualified for and Naval ROTC scholarship, but you may not be medically qualified for the Naval Academy. But this requirement only has to be done once, regardless of how many academies uh, or programs you apply to. We talked about the nomination process. Uh, our candidate cycle begins in January of your junior year. And that's so that you can apply for summer seminar, which is our version of the SLE that um, West Point has. So that window is already closed. So if you are currently a sophomore in January of your junior year, you should begin the process in order to take advantage of all the opportunities that you, you uh, are available to learn about the Naval Academy. Uh, at graduation, you will graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree and you'll be commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy or Marine Corps. Depending on the program you enter after graduation, there's a minimum five-year service commitment that could be longer uh, depending on what your warfare specialty is. So at the Naval Academy, the primary warfare specialties are surface warfare, where you serve aboard a surface ship such as a destroyer, a cruiser, an aircraft carrier. You could be in the submarine force. After additional training in nuclear power, you could report aboard a ballistic missile submarine or an attack submarine. You could be selected as a naval aviator and you could fly fixed wing aircraft such as cargo transports, fighters or attack aircraft. We also have helicopters uh, and you could be assigned to a helicopter unit as well. We do have special forces, which is both uh, the SEALs and the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit. It's a very small portion of our graduates. 
and approximately 20% of every class goes into the Marine Corps, and that could either be Marine Aviation or Marine Ground. So if I were to just give you a picture of what the 2021 service assignments were like, so the Academy graduated about 1,080 officers, and you can see that surface warfare, whether it was conventional or nuclear, took a little over 170 individuals, just over 100 graduates went into the submarine force. Uh, the SEALs took uh, a small number of people, roughly 47 individuals. Naval aviation uh, took uh, just over 200, and the Marine Corps uh, took the balance. If while at the Naval Academy, uh, you are unable to be uh, complete the physical requirement for graduation, and you are not physically qualified, the Naval Academy will still graduate you, but you will not be assigned uh, an unrestricted line uh, position. You would uh, look to the right side of this chart and we would assign you into a restricted line uh, billet, such as cryptology, cyber, oceanography, medical, civil engineering, or supply corps. But the primary goal for the Naval Academy is to put as many officers into the unrestricted line as possible. Our admissions considerations are similar to what the Congressman is looking at, as well as the other service academies. We take a whole person assessment. We look for excellent moral character, mental and physical fitness. We are interested in individuals who want to become officers in the Naval service. You need to show demonstrated potential for leadership. We'd like you to be able to complete the four years at the academy and stay in the service beyond the initial obligation. Our admission board strongly considers candidates who reflect society and meet the needs of the Naval Service. And we want to ensure that the path to leadership is visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every racial, gender, ethnic, socioeconomic, religious, and geographic background. So my advice for admissions is to continue to build a strong foundation in math and science. While we have no minimum GPA, we look for individuals who are in the top 20% of their high school class. We do require at this point SATs and ACTs. Academic courses that are advanced placement, honors or IB are encouraged. And our well-rounded view is demonstrated through your leadership and your activity and athletic and non-athletic activities. So uh, this presentation should be available through the con Congressional office. If you have follow up questions or you want a copy of it or you have a, I didn't cover something that you'd like to discuss, you can reach out to me directly at either my cell phone or email address. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if there's time and there are questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so while we allow folks to put in questions relevant to the Naval Academy, I do see one question we have in here about West Point. So Robert, if you might be able to tackle this, does acceptance or non-acceptance to SLE have any bearing on final acceptance to the Academy? Sorry, that's, uh, okay, I, I think it's at SLE. I think it was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, that doesn't have a bearing on, um, the acceptance to the academy. It's a separate, um, that's a simple answer. Great, thank you. And then this, I guess, could be tackled by all the academies. So is the Navy the only branch that pays and considers you serving during your time in the academy? Does this count as time in service? I'll have to check on mine. I think it might've changed since I was in, um, so I'll have to come back and answer that separately. Um, I can answer for the United States Coast Guard Academy. Um, it doesn't count towards time in your like committed service. So that five-year service obligation, it doesn't count towards, um, and it also doesn't count towards your overall service, but you do get paid. Um, in addition to that, if you attend one of our prep school programs, so if you attend the Coast Guard Academy Scholars Program, that year does count towards your overall time and service, not towards your commitment though. So you still have to serve five years, but after that five years, you would technically have six years. 
um, in service to the academy. So that goes towards your retirement if it's for the prep school. Um, but your time at the academy, those four years don't go towards retirement or your service obligation. Um, and then for all of them, you do get paid. Great. Thanks. And if anyone missed it um, in the chat, we also have that the same applies for the Air Force Academy. All right. And then um, question, another question we have is, did the, does the Naval Academy require the SAT and ACT with the SA? Can you hear me? Yes, the Naval Academy requires an SAT uh, and ACT with the essay. Great, thank you. And then I don't see any other questions, but keep putting them in the Q&A box as they come up. Um, next up we have from the United States Merchant Marine Academy, Commander Mike Bedrick. So we'll pass it on to you. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Okay, we're working on the first shot. Great, fantastic. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Commander Mike Bedrick. I work here at the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York. Uh, we are uh, one of five service academies and perhaps uh, the least known. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about us and uh, about some of our unique features. Uh, really uh, excited to talk to uh, everyone here on this virtual event. Uh, to the students, uh, congratulations to you on uh, where you are currently and your desire to serve. I think uh, there is really nothing better than uh, serving uh, our great nation. And so kudos to you for aspiring to be young leaders across our services. And to the parents, thank you for your mentorship to your sons and daughters to this point. Uh, I know without that, they wouldn't be going to aspire to what they're about to do or do in the future. Uh, so a little bit about the academy. We are a very small academy uh, We're located on the North Shore of Long Island, which is just outside of New York City. Uh, in fact, uh, if you jump on the Long Island Railroad, uh, that takes you about uh, 30 or so minutes to get into the heart of New York City at Penn Station. And from our campus, uh, if you were to look outward, you'd see Queens, uh, the Bronx, and then in the distance, Manhattan. So just a few to be spending uh, your four years in college. I mentioned we're a small campus. We only enroll about a, we only have an enrollment of about 1,000 students at any given time. So we bring in a class of about 250 to 280 students per year, and that's from across the country. Uh, we are federally funded, so there are no tuition costs, obviously, and we cover all, all expenses. So there's a, a small fee that you pay uh, each year that covers uh, you know, <coughs> all of your expenses and tailoring, but outside of that, uh, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, like all the academies, we do have small classrooms. I mean, we're a small school and very specialized. Uh, so you can expect uh, your largest classroom to be really about 24, 25 people. And then as you look at your majors, they'll be much smaller. And we pride ourselves on uh, not only being a four-year academic uh, institution, but also a program that offers uh, experiential learning uh, through what we call SEER. And I'll hit that in a subsequent slide. And I'm gonna go through this fairly rapidly. I only have eight slides here. Uh, and so uh, I'll definitely um, try to go as quickly, quickly as possible so that we can save time for more questions. So the first question I, I or anyone working in the academy gets is, well, what do merchant mariners do, right? It's one of those things where unless uh, you're in a coastal region, you don't really see it, right? Uh, if you're uh, in the interior of the country, it's probably even more foreign to you. Uh, but uh, think of the merchant marine as the commercial maritime industry. So those are privately owned vessels that are moving stuff. They're moving cargo from ports A to ports B across the world. A majority of the world's shipping is still done over bodies of water. And so uh, that is supremely important to our uh, economic power as a country, right? And the great thing is uh, a majority of our graduates go directly into the maritime industry uh, working for a privately owned company, uh, just doing really well uh, in that industry and uh, building it upon their success. And I'll speak to that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. But we're also called the fourth arm defense. And this is uh, substantial because in times of war, uh, the, the merchant marine uh, does a lot of movement of material, of weapons, of supplies, of fuel, of subsistence items 
uh, from the United States to uh, other ports. So essentially, if, uh, if, we, uh, if we have a full scale war and we have to mobilize and move personnel from point A to point B, a division can fight onto land and sustain themselves for uh, a matter of days. At that point, we have to be able to uh, continue supplying that war fight. And that's where the merchant marine comes in uh, and very important part of what uh, we do in the defense of our nation. So some key information here. Um, the top of the slide you'll see what you earn. Uh, just like any other academy, you're gonna get a bachelor's of science degree. Um, we are a very specialized uh, curriculum, uh, but at the end of the day, everyone is taking a core curriculum similar to the other academies, and therefore you will get a bachelor's of science. Uh, you also get a merchant marine officer license, which is uh, guaranteed. Every graduate uh, is required to sit for a merchant marine officer license, and you get that license regardless of the path that you're going to take. And then uh, you, of course, get a commission in the armed forces. Uh, this is where it gets really awesome. So um, we are the only academy where consistently uh, a large percentage of our class uh, will go on active duty to any branch of service that they desire. Uh, so I mentioned majority of our students do go into the maritime ministry uh, and they fulfill their service application uh, in two ways. One is they uh, sail uh, for a company, meaning they work for a maritime company uh, sailing aboard vessels, uh, making uh, uh, great amounts of money. And then they fulfill their reserve obligation as Navy strategic sea lift officers. And the cool part is uh, that requirement really amounts to about two weeks per year. Uh, so uh, this is where that reserve option is pretty cool. But for the students that are aspiring to be active duty officers, uh, you can in fact apply to any branch of service. Uh, that includes the Army, uh, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, uh, the Space Force, uh, and even NOAA. So if you're looking to be a pilot or an aviator uh, in any branch, you can certainly do that. If you're looking to be an intelligence, you can do that. If you're looking to be a surface warfare officer, you can do that. If you're looking to be an infantry officer, you can certainly do that. Uh, if you're looking to be a Navy SEAL, that is an option for you because a lot of students will come in and maybe they're not really sure about what they want to do or uh, their mind changes. Uh, we have an army liaison at the, on the academy grounds. We have a Marine Corps gunny uh, and uh, he doesn't smile very often and he prepares you for the Marine Corps. Uh, we have a Coast Guard station at the academy. We liaison there. We have a Naval Science Department that prepares you for obviously your Naval Commission. And then we also liaise with a local Air Force ROTC program to get you those additional requirements. So really a, uh, a neat program if you're not really certain on what academy you want to go to, or if you're applying to a DOD academy, it is a Department of Defense Academy, and you want to use us as a second option, that is certainly okay. At the end of the day, you are going to be obligated to work in the maritime ministry for five years, and then serve your uh, reserve obligation for eight years, or you go on active duty for five years in a branch of your choice uh, subject to approval by that service. So pretty awesome. Programs, academics. We only have five majors. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking at uh, a variety of majors like Army or Navy or Air Force uh, or even Coast Guard, we just don't offer that. Uh, we don't have any liberal arts majors. Our curriculum is geared toward ensuring that you get your licensure as a mariner, as a licensed mariner, to aspire to be either a deck officer, i.e. a captain of a ship, or a chief engineer of a ship. And these five majors are the majors that support that. Uh, so on one side, you have marine transportation and maritime logistics and security to fall under that one department. And then on the engineering side, you have marine engineering uh, down the shipyard management. And a lot of students will, uh, will ask the question, what is exactly marine, marine engineering? Well, it's exactly what it is. It's a focus on engineering on marine systems, uh, marine architecture, uh, ships, but think of it as being a mechanical engineer uh, or an electric engineer. And uh, you will be very uh, familiarized with all those courses at the academy should you take an engineering curriculum because uh, you're looking on average of about 165 credits over the four years here. We are a division three school, so competition is important. Uh, we do look for athletes 
Coast Guard Academy uh, is our, uh, our biggest rival out there. And uh, that rivalry is quite awesome. We also have a very robust waterfront program. And we're a campus that's located right on the water, right in the North Shore of Long Island. So obviously we have a great program. And then we have a variety of clubs that you can participate in just like you would at any other college. So I mentioned this very briefly, and uh, this is what really separates us from uh, other programs out there. We have what's called a senior, uh, and definitely the world is our camp. Neat about the academy is when you were here to the academy for training, um, it's only 17 days. So you're going through a train up of about 17 days, and then we take you right into classes. We're based on a trimester system, uh, and it is pretty rapid. It's a, it's a rapid way of learning in the trimester system, but we have to do that because during your second and third year, we will send you out to sea on an ocean going vessel as a paid apprentice. Uh, think of it that way. So uh, during your sophomore year, you're going to spend only one term on campus, uh, correction, two terms on campus. And then during your junior year, you're going to spend one term on campus, which is awesome. You, you do your first year as a plebe, and then, you know, for the majority of your second and third year, you're actually off campus uh, doing like hands-on training, getting paid for it, uh, going to see the world. And wherever that vessel is going, whether it is through the Suez Canal, through the Panama Canal, uh, to the Middle East, uh, to the Antarctic, you can be on that vessel. You might be in a vessel. In fact, if you see that kind of that inset picture of the Polar Star, uh, two of our midshipmen were aboard uh, the Polar Star vessel that set a Guinness World Record uh, in March for uh, the southernmost navigation of a region on Earth, which is pretty awesome, right? Where else are you going to be able to do that? Uh, so uh, you do your senior year uh, during your second and third year, and then during your senior year, you are back in the classroom, and you are assuming more of a leadership role within the academy, and that's where we're going to start polishing you and the great leaders that you are going to be once you commission. Uh, so uh, if you're looking for a little bit more information about SEER, definitely visit our website, contact us, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Options and opportunities, they abound. I mentioned you can commission any branch of service. So if you're looking for, to work for military sea lift command, or if you're, you're working to look on a, work on a cargo ship, uh, tons of opportunities for you. You can work in a shipyard, uh, you can work aboard a submarine, uh, you can have an internship with an Air Force squadron or a Navy squadron uh, during your junior year. And of course, uh, we are just outside of New York City. Uh, so uh, once you're done with your plebe year uh, and you're now considered an upperclassman, you'll be able to get out off campus and actually see a little bit of New York as well. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, you know, those opportunities are, uh, are, are just tremendous. And I encourage you to look at what we have to offer by contacting us. So how to get in, a uh, very similar process to other academies. Uh, you need a nomination, you need to pass a fitness test, you need to qualify medically. Our application is open currently, so get online and start your application today. Uh, and I tell you to start it today and start it for all the academies today, if you can, if you're a junior, a rising junior, um, because some of these processes are quite tough, particularly the qualification, um, the medical qualification, could take you several months to get to that process. And you don't want to delay that because that is key. What we look for academically, uh, we have a very challenging curriculum. You're going to earn your degree over here. We want to have calculus and physics, we want you to have chemistry. And then we do look at your academics. And obviously, we want to make sure that you demonstrate some great leadership potential as well. I mentioned the application is open now. It closes in February. Uh, you can apply to our website. And we do do both day and overnight visits. Uh, you can certainly visit our academy. Just contact us at admissions at usmma.edu uh, to schedule a visit. Uh, we have visits on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, I'll pause here for any questions, but I'll also be available for questions uh, toward the end. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And while you were presenting, Kevin and I were messaging offline about the photo of the penguins during sea year. We were both very intrigued by that. Um, I did show a photo of the penguins and then also of puppies because uh, we have a service dog program on the campus. Uh, so 
it's it's kind of funny. Like people are drawn to that stuff. So puppies okay. and penguins, amazing. Definitely. Um, while we are waiting or giving time for students to put in questions about Merchant Marine Academy, I see a question in the chat from John Sanderson about how to get recommended for a prep year. I'm not sure if that was geared toward a specific school or not. So John, if you wanted to follow up on that, um, let me see if we can get that answered for you. Oh, for the Naval Academy. <laughs> All right, can you hear me? All right, so the Naval Academy, you do not apply for a prep school program. Uh, the Naval Academy will consider you for a prep school program if it believes that you are a good candidate for admission, but have some weakness that a prep school can rectify. Great, thank you. And then um, we have a few questions from Merchant Marine Academy in the um, Q&A. So do you have to take both the SAT and ACT or is just one of them okay? Just one, uh, we recommend you to take uh, both though uh, because we do super score. So your highest scores are gonna be counted towards your application. Um, by and large, I think out of uh, the Northeast, we tend to see more SATs than ACTs. Great. Thank you. And then next question we have is, can you still apply to the Merchant Marine Academy if you are taking physics and calculus next year? So I'm assuming that means senior. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to take a look at your transcripts, uh, even going into your senior year. Uh, so definitely encourage it. Um, and it's uh, like a final point here. Um, you know, Massachusetts gets a certain amount of allocations per year. It's five, actually, the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, this year, we left three uh, vacancies open. So we gave them to New York. Uh, I don't know if the folks in Massachusetts are comfortable about that, but definitely don't let that happen next year. Uh, we want to see uh, we want to see Massachusetts take all the five spots. Great. Thank you for that. And then um, we have one more question pop up in the chat. Again, this is about Naval Academy, actually. Um, it's a question about would a previous concussion disqualify someone medically from Naval Academy? Only your doctor can answer that. So if you are applying to the Naval Academy and you uh, complete the medical examination, uh, the medical doctors will uh, provide the information to the Naval Academy and the Naval Academy will make a decision on your condition as to whether or not you're medically qualified. Great. And then we just had another question pop, a few questions popping in. Um, so back to Merchant Marine Academy. Isn't there a Merchant Marine Academy in Massachusetts? So maybe you could speak to how that differs from Mass Maritime. Yeah, so uh, Mass Maritime is another fantastic school. The difference is it is a state school. So under the Maritime Administration, which uh, Merchant Marine Academy falls under, uh, MARAD, uh, for short for Maritime Administration, also has a number of state academies, which include Massachusetts, Maine, New York, uh, A&M, Great Lakes, and California. Great, thank you. And then one more question. I'm not sure which school this is specific to. I'm going to guess Merchant Marine Academy, but correct if I'm wrong. Um, for nominations, oh, actually, sorry, this is for Kevin and I. For nominations, what is the SAT score average that you are looking for? Kevin, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle yeah. that? Uh, so we don't have any benchmark criteria. Uh, we compare all the applicants across the board. Um, so typically uh, we've had uh, in the previous two years now, individuals not submit SAT score. So it's tough to really gear it towards um, a specific number. So what we say, Raya, is if you believe that your SAT score is a good representation of your academic abilities, submit it. Um, and even if you do submit it, if we find that weighting your GPA a little heavier than that SAT score would be more favorable in your uh, nomination decision, that's how we'll calculate it. Um, so we definitely recommend studying as a lot of the academy said, they do require it. So uh, very much focus a lot 
of your time in the next few months studying and getting some of the prep books if you can, um, taking any classes that might be available to you and then really knock that out of the park. But understand that at least for our nomination process, we'll always give you the benefit of the doubt of however we grade your academics, whether it's solely GPA based or if the SAT is included, but we don't have a benchmark or an average that we look for each year. Thanks, Kevin. And one last question, and then we will move on to Air Force Academy. This is open for all the academies. Um, what about food allergies with medical requirements? Um, are there any academies that would disqualify someone for having a food allergy? I, I think I can speak for all of us. Um, none of us are going to answer that just because it's a medical decision and only a doctor can um, tell you whether or not for sure that you're going to be medically disqualified for any condition. Perfect, thank you and noted. So any medical questions, probably best to get more of an individualized answer on with a medical professional. Great, and with that, we will open it up to Lieutenant Kiana Brantley from the United States Air Force Academy. Okay, hi everyone. My name is uh, Second Lieutenant Kiana Brantley. I just graduated from the Air Force Academy uh, last year, May of 21. It's actually really crazy. My one year anniversary is coming up as graduation for this year's class is coming up tomorrow. Um, so here's the Air Force Academy. Um, we're located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The campus itself is sort of in the mountains as you can see here. And so we're located at about 7,000 feet above sea level. The mission of the Air Force Academy is to educate, train, and inspire men and women to become officers of character, motivated to lead in the United States Air Force and Space Force in service of our nation. Um, so while you're at the Air Force Academy, there's going to be three different things that you're constantly being ranked and compared to and just stacked against all of your classmates with, and that's academics, military performance, and physical or athletics. Um, so this first piece, academics, right? We're currently the number three public college in the country. As you can see on the far right side of your screen, we have really awesome programs that are ranked very highly um, in multiple different programs, engineering, um, as you can see. And then if you're not interested in going STEM, we have a really great National Liberal Arts College opportunity for you as well. We offer 32 different academic majors and minors. Everything you see here on the screen with an asterisk next to it is an academic minor that is available to you. Philosophy is bolded in asterisk because it's both a major and a minor that you can choose to study. And we have space operations and space war fighting that are brand new. They're only about a year old uh, for people who are really, really excited and passionate about the space force. Along with this, I'd like to add that there are 91 and a half semester hours of core classes at the Air Force Academy. That is significantly more than you're gonna have at your average university. And the reason for that is when you graduate, you're gonna be responsible for multi-million dollar assets and you're gonna be responsible for people. And the Air Force Academy just really wants you to have a really good understanding of everything that you see here on the screen. So I myself, I studied behavioral science, which is a mix of psychology and sociology, but I've taken classes in aeronautical engineering, astronautical engineering, legal studies, and I even took a meteorology uh, course. Um, because of that, everyone who graduates from the Air Force Academy graduates with a Bachelor of Science in whatever it is they studied. So I have a Bachelor of Science in Behavioral Science. Uh, my roommate senior year was a history major. She has her Bachelor of Science in History. Going on to athletics, every uh, person who goes to the Air Force Academy is an athlete. It's true for all of the service academies. We have um, three different levels of athlete. So we have 27 NCAA Division I sports with 17 of them being for men and 10 of them being for ladies. Along with that, we have club sports who are awesome and really, really competitive. It's just they're competing at a D2, D3 level. And then if you don't do that, you get to do squadron intramurals, which is something I did. Um, really, really fun. You get to go out and compete in lots of different sports um, against other squadrons in the cadet wing. That last piece, and in my opinion, the most important is the military training. Because the Air Force Academy is a military institution, you're gonna get lots of military training and it's gonna start off with six and a half weeks of basic cadet training the summer before you uh, show up. Basic cadet training is split up into two different halves. And so during that first half of BCT, you're gonna learn all of the basics behind what it means to be a military member. You're gonna learn how to wear your uniform, military customs and courtesies, and just every basic, thing that you need to know as a military member. 
after that, you and the rest of your class will march out to this place called Jackson ba uh, Jacks Valley. It gets really messy. There's lots of obstacle courses. Uh, you learn a lot about yourself and you get to do lots of team building. And then you come back and the academic year starts. Once you're back in the cadet wing, military training does not, um, does not stop. It actually continues and it ramps up uh, throughout your four years. You'll have the opportunity to learn different things as far as leadership. You'll have room and uniform inspections. Um, and you'll have really, really awesome speakers come out and speak to you. Elon Musk was at the Academy, if not last month and the month before, um, and he was out there speaking to different cadets about lots of things happening in space, which is really cool. So at the Air Force Academy, we have a lot of really incredible opportunities for cadets. I'm gonna speak on each of these really, really quickly. Um, and as you can see in that top left picture, we have someone jumping out of a plane. That is our jump program. The Air Force Academy happens to be the only place in the entire world where your first jump out of a plane is by yourself. If you do it five times, you get to earn your wings, which I have here on my uniform. You can kind of see it. Um, I get to wear my wings for the rest of my military career. And like I said, the Air Force Academy is the only place you get to do it. Um, so it's really, really rewarding, uh, rewarding program. We have powered flight, where if you're interested in learning how to fly a plane, you can learn that. And if you get good at it, you can go off and compete. We have our cyber club. We have space operations where cadets learn the physics behind building and launching satellites into space. We have our remotely piloted aircraft club for drones where you get to build them and just learn a lot of really cool stuff about that. And then in that bottom right picture, we have soaring. Soaring um, is something else I had the opportunity of doing while I was at the academy. And that is a plane without an engine. So essentially what happens is a plane with an engine will attach to you with a rope They'll carry you up into the air and then when you hit a certain altitude they just drop you and then you gracefully glide back down to the surface of the earth while you're gliding back down you're up there doing flips and turns and you're able to stall the plane it's a lot of fun um, and just to sort of go into how the air force academy is different than your average university um, i was doing soaring at 7 30 in the morning before my calculus class it was a part of my academic day as a freshman which is really, really exciting um, and really, really fun. My mom was disappointed, but uh, I had a great time. <laughs> so similar to how some of the other academy spoke on it, we have lots of really great uh, traveling opportunities for you. If you choose to study a language, you can spend three weeks over the summer in a country that hosts that language, and you can just sort of fully immerse yourself in that. We have foreign exchange where you can do a semester abroad at a different um, in a different country, civilian, or you can even go to a different country's Air Force Academy equivalent. One of my best friends went to Spain, uh, the Spanish Air Force Academy, our senior year, and so she had a great time. You do service academy exchange. We offer summer research. Ops Air Force is something that they send every single cadet to, where you go off to an active duty Air Force base, and you get to shadow young officers in every career field on that base, so that when it's your turn to decide what job you want to do, you're making an informed decision. And then that last one is cultural immersion. This is something else I had the opportunity of participating in while I was at the Air Force Academy. And the Air Force Academy sent me to Nepal for 21 days uh, with the entire purpose of that trip being to learn about a different culture. So while I was in Nepal, I did a five day trek to Annapurna Base Camp. I had the opportunity to canoe in Pokhara. I was walking around a national park, um, exploring Kathmandu, which is the capital of Nepal. It was an incredible trip that the Air Force Academy fully funded. And I learned a lot about myself, the team I was with, um, and just an entire like culture in a different part of the world. Very, very rewarding. We've had some incredible people who have gone to the Air Force Academy and they've gone off to do incredible things both in the Air Force and in the civilian sector. Our current Secretary of the Air Force is an Air Force Academy graduate. We've had astronauts, CEOs, members of Congress, and even professional athletes. So there was someone that's a part of my class. He just signed on with um, the Saints for NFL. So big deal. Um, and my point in the slide is a lot of people, they hear Service Academy. And I don't think this applies for all of you because you're looking at it. But they think that um, Service Academies are just a bunch of high school, I mean, college students marching around and we're like robots. And all we do is march and go to class. And yes, we do those things, but we do so much more. And if you take half of the lessons that all of these academies are giving to you and you choose to take them in and internalize them and turn them into something that you can use, you are capable of doing anything that you choose to do because we are given so many important lessons and we all acquire so much. So you can be really successful in the civilian sector as well. 
So here's a list of all of the different Space Force career opportunities that we have for officers. It is a very small, um, small, small job list just because the Space Force is very small and they're very select. I don't see it growing much more beyond this, but this is also the Space Force's second or third year um, in operation. So it may grow, but right now this is what we have for space. And these are our Air Force career opportunities for officers. Uh, so with the Air Force Academy, if you graduate from the Air Force Academy, you have a five-year military service commitment, unless you choose to do anything in that far left column. Uh, pilot is gonna be 10 years, and then lawyer is going to be seven. Everything in the middle, I don't have an exact number for how much more uh, time you owe. With our application, I'm not gonna go into much detail on this because I think it's really important if you're looking at it going to the Air Force Academy that you do research. But if you do have questions, academyadmissions.com is there for you. Uh, please go to that website. It will lay out every single answer to every question that you have. It'll walk you through how to do all of this. And that is actually where you can do your application. If you do still have a question, there's a link on that webpage that you can send in a question to, and that question will go directly to me. And I'll make sure to give you an answer quickly and promptly. And, and this applies to all of the academies, but I always love to, to sort of hit on this while I end. If you choose to go to the Air Force Academy and you're accepted, uh, you're essentially accepting a $400,000 scholarship to the number three public college in the country uh, because we have no tuition costs and no room and board costs. When you graduate, you have a guaranteed career for at least five years. Uh, while you're at the academy, you have a monthly stipend. By the time I was a senior, I was making about $900 a month for being a cadet full time. And then you'll have medical and dental coverage while at the academy. That is all I have. I'll open it up for questions now. Yeah, we'll just give it another minute or so for people to type questions into the Q&A box. All right, so question we got. Um, would having a private pilot's license make a candidate more attractive for Air Force Academy admissions? I wouldn't say it would make you more attractive. Most of the people who go to the Air Force Academy are going with the intent of flying. And so a lot of people have it, but it will definitely help you with your pilot application as the more flight hours you have, the more competitive you are for actually being selected to be a pilot. So doing it is really good and it will definitely add to your application, but it won't, I don't want you to have the expectation. It'll help you super stand out either. Um, Thank you. We have a question in the chat about what is just the average SAT score for Air Force Academy? Yes, so the average SAT score is about a 1300 to a 1400 for the Air Force Academy. And then I see another question, if there's a rough percentage breakdown for how many cadets go into and are accepted into TACP. I do not have the exact number for you. I know it is a small uh, select number, but I do not have that off of the top of my head. I apologize. All right, and then we have another question. Would being a member of the Civil Air Patrol make for a more attractive candidate for the academy? Definitely. We're looking for leaders, um, leaders of character. So if you're in Civil Air Patrol, find a way, if you haven't already, to have a leadership position within that. Um, initiate some things, lead within the program, because leading and leadership is what we really, really value at the Air Force Academy. Civil Air Patrol is awesome, so good on you for doing it. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much. And oh, one last one came in. How many of the Air Force Academy students are going into Space Force and are there any additional requirements to enter Space Force? I also don't have numbers on this because it's so new. We've had two classes that have directly, um, well, now this, this class that's graduating tomorrow, we have three classes that have had direct um, commissions into the Space Force. Each of them has been a little different just because the Space Force is so new. Um, so I don't have an exact number, but I can tell you um, 
for now, right now, and it could change by the time you all go and graduate, um, they're doing like an application process uh, and to select people who are going into the space course. And so they're doing interviews and they're looking over um, each person who expresses interest in the space course. They're looking at their cadet performance. They're getting um, recommendations from their squadron commanders and all of that. But if you end up not getting selected to go to the air, the, the space force, you can still continue on in the air force. The space force is just very selective and small right now. Great, thanks. And we'll take this one last one about Air Force and then move on to Coast Guard because I know we're running a few minutes behind. Um, so how many applicants does the Air Force Academy have yearly and how many does it accept? Um, so on average, we have about 11,000 um, people open up an application for the Air Force Academy and we select about 1,100. Out of that 11,000 who open their application, we end up having about 4,500 that are competitive and qualified. Uh, so if you can receive your nomination and if you can make sure that your academics are solid and you do really well on your CFA and you have the leadership, you're at about a 25% chance of getting in. Um, it's just getting to that point that can be a little challenging. Thank you. Great, great question. So thanks everyone. And now we will open it up to Lieutenant Emily Torsney of the Coast Guard Academy. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Okay. Alrighty. So good evening, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Junior Grade Emily Torsney. I'm the Northeast Admissions Officer at the United States Coast Guard Academy, which is located in New London, Connecticut. Um, I'll keep everything brief because to be honest, if you haven't realized already, there are a lot of similarities similarities between the different service academies. So uh, leaders of character, you know, good grades, academics, athletics, all those kind of key words you're going to hear are going to be pretty similar amongst the different academies in terms of formulating a competitive application. Uh, that being said, I will preface, uh, the United States Coast Guard Academy does not require a congressional nomination for you to apply. Um, and our application is purely online through our own portal, free of charge, similar to the other academies as well, but no congressional nomination. So as I said, New London, Connecticut, uh, we're nestled in between Boston, Massachusetts, New York City, and Hartford, Connecticut. So right along uh, the New England coastline. The United States Coast Guard as a whole is a humanitarian service. We are one of the six armed forces, but that being said, we fall under the Department of Homeland Security, not Department of Defense. So do note that. And what we're focusing on is a humanitarian mission. As for our cadet enrollment, we have a little uh, around 1,100 cadets enrolled at the academy. We are one of the smaller service academies, about 103 acres in size. But that being said, there are some stats there. We have representation. Uh, and this is across all four years. So 50 states, um, our uh, percentage data, we're actually about closer to 42% female now, 38% underrepresented minority. Those are just some average GPAs, SAT scores, things of that nature. But do note that we have a holistic application review. So although these are averages, I always, always, always recommend students apply to the academy if they're interested because between our prep school, um, opportunities as well as just what we're looking at for the class as a whole or what we like to see in terms of our applicants. It's so much more than just those academics. Although they're important, uh, we do like to see what you bring to the table. In terms of who we are as a community, um, we are an engineering and STEM based school. So I will talk about our majors in a moment, but a good chunk of them are engineering specific, although we do have some humanities related majors. And once again, similar to the other service academies, um, we're tuition free, but that being said, nothing is free in this world. Uh, you are required to pay back in a service obligation. So a time obligation, which is five years upon graduation from the Academy of Service. But once again, 100% job placement, um, I have two stats that start with the number 85. So 85% of students do earn a graduate degree in the Coast Guards. We have graduate school opportunities, but 85% of Coast Guard Academy grads actually go on to serve longer than that five-year service obligation. Once again, super small kind of campus as a whole, which means you're having more access to teachers, faculty, and staff. So eight to one student to teacher ratio. You're never gonna have a class size larger than 20 students. Um, everything is very hands-on lab-based regardless of your major. And that being said, 
your faculty are going to know you first name, last name, hometown basis. We have three types of faculty members at the academy. We have tenured professors, so those are civilians with PhDs who've been there for a very long time. We have rotating military faculty, which are individuals who are active duty Coast Guard. They're at the academy for three to four years, and then they rotate out, so they bring you kind of that operational experience. And then we also have tenured military professors, so active duty uh, military members that are there full time for the rest of their careers. They want to be there to teach you. If I could just interject, I don't think you are on slideshow mode, so we haven't been able to see the slides changing. Oh, excuse just me. Just want to go through those quickly. That'd be great. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> My bad. Um, all righty. Can you see that now? We're still just seeing like um, like the PowerPoint. Like I don't know. We're not seeing the slideshow mode. Interesting. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk through it because I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and instead just talk through everything. And if people have questions or want to see the slideshow, you can join us for an admissions brief at your convenience. My apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, that being said, so once again, I touched on kind of what you're experiencing in terms of the classroom at the academy three pillars that we base our curriculum off of to build you into leaders of character is academics, leadership, and athletics. To prepare for this, I highly recommend you take three target courses. They're not required to apply, but they can definitely help you. This goes for all service academies. Pre-calc or calculus, chemistry, and physics. Work to take those courses at the highest level available to you. So focus on honors courses, AP courses, IB, dual enrollment, so on and so forth. Um, as for our majors, we have nine academic majors, so luckily I can list them all off to you by memory. Um, the five engineering majors are civil engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, cyber systems, and naval architecture and marine engineering. Then we have our government and our management major. Marine and environmental science is kind of like our bio and chem majors. And then operations research and computer analysis is the ninth major all result in a Bachelor of Science and all relate to our primary missions, which like I said, we have 11 statutory missions that encompass maritime safety, maritime security and maritime stewardship. You can major in anything you want and do any job in the Coast Guard that you're interested in. Uh, you do have cadet summer training programs that you will be involved in each summer. You'll have some time off to yourself to go home, but you'll also have time where we build in exposure to the fleet um, exposure to leadership roles and responsibilities. Um, and then once again, we also have kind of a boot camp summer going into your first year at the Academy Notice Swab Summer. Number of athletics available at the Academy. Uh, we're a Division Three school for our varsity sports, and we also have clubs and intramurals, and you can find all of that on the website. As for the application, like I said, 100% online. Um, we have letters of recommendation that are required. Those are from a guidance counselor, an English instructor, and a math instructor. You can submit two additional layers of recommendation if you desire to do so. Highly recommend completing those optional portions, um, as well as the physical fitness exam. So that's mile and a half run, cadence push-ups, and curl-ups. It's out of a score of 300. We recommend a 200 plus. Any of these stats I'm throwing out at you, if you want, you can email me and I'm happy to assist. All my email information is located on the website and I can include it in the chat. Um, as for SATs and ACTs, we are test optional, do note that. However, as mentioned previously by another academy, recommend taking them, it can't hurt. Take more than once if you can, we do super score. We do also have the Dodmer medical process involved. Um, and then as a reminder, no congressional nomination. Lastly, as for critical dates, we have an early action and a regular decision applicant pool. Um, both are non-binding. Early action deadline is October 15th. Regular admission deadline is January 15th. If you have additional information, please do not hesitate to reach out. We offer campus programs all throughout the year. They'll kick back up in the fall, um, and that's where you can come on campus and experience the Academy directly. I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. We did have a question come in for Air Force Academy during that time. So is Air Force Academy test optional? 
The Air Force Academy is not test optional. The SAT and ACT are required. Maybe while we wait for students to um, type in questions about Coast Guard Academy, I know Kevin has a video he can share from the congressman, if not to put you on the spot, but if you're ready to queue that up. Let me grab that really quick. Perfect. All right, and let me cue that up for everybody and let me know if the audio comes through because sometimes it gets a little funky. I am Jake Otten, class of the Congressman, also a former Marine officer, and I'm enjoying the United States Marine Corps for the best decisions I ever made. You are making a terrific decision to apply to United States Service Academies. These are institutions that will transform your life. Thank you for your willingness to serve. My office is here to support you. Short and sweet from our congressman. I know it's a little difficult to hear, but um, he does wish he could be here tonight. And this is obviously something he's very interested in. He's a veteran himself. So um, definitely appreciates all of your willingness to serve. Um, and while we had that going, we had um, a question for Coast Guard. Can you commission into the military from the Coast Guard Academy? Yes, so the Coast Guard is one of the six armed forces. So we are a military branch. So upon graduation from the Coast Guard Academy, you do serve as a Coast Guard officer, just as I am. Great, well, thank you. We will wrap it up here. If you have any follow-up questions, oh. Oh yes, okay, perfect. Thank you for putting that in. Um, yeah, so if you have any follow-up questions for our office or if you'd like to get in touch with any of the Academy reps we have here tonight and don't know how to find their info, just let me know. Um, I, I'll throw my email in the chat one more time just so you all have it. Um, thank you again to everyone for coming tonight. We know it's a bit late, so we appreciate you staying on with us this whole time and special thank you to all of our Academy reps for doing the late night shift with us. Um, and yeah, our office is here to support in any way that we can. So just don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. And with that, we will conclude, but I hope everybody has a great rest of the school year, a healthy summer coming up. And if you need anything, please do reach out, but everyone have a lovely rest of the night.